Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity for us to be able to come together, for us to have this chance to be able to worship, celebrate, and adore you. Father, we just pray that you will continue to unleash, unleash your passion upon us this morning. And as we dig into the solution that you provided for us and being able to ask the question, why am I here? Why do I exist? I pray that we step into that and really begin to embrace the calling that you've placed upon our lives. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. Good morning. I just want to invite you guys to stand and worship with us. Coming on the cloud.
to this message and to this word to speak to us so clearly. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So how's everyone doing this morning? Good? I know I am doing exceptionally well. College football season's kicked off. NFL's kicking off on Thursday. Good week. It's a good week. Uh, so I, I just wanted to start with, I remember, it was early 2000s, and I was invited to go to Arta Cruz, Brazil. And we were there to do a church conference where we were meeting with pastors from the local area as well as their leaders. And it was a conference, about 1,000 people or so were there. So it was just an amazing experience for us. So. We had main sessions, we had breakout sessions, and, and we had the opportunity just to be able to encourage people. And the person that organized the conference came to me on the last day of the conference and said to me, Ken, we're changing the program. I feel like God is telling me, you need to close the program out tonight. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Uh, tonight? You know, I, I haven't had time to prepare a message. Like, what are you talking about tonight? And he just said, well, I just, I just feel that way. I feel like God's saying, change the whole thing, and you're closing out tonight. So I was like, well, thank you. So, uh, so I started praying, and I was like, well, God, because one of the things I, I, I struggle with then, and I still struggle with sometimes now, is this feeling of my own personal inadequacy. And I thought, God, what do I have to say to a thousand pastors and leaders because at that point, I wasn't a pastor yet. I was still just an associate pastor. Like, God, what do I have to say to all of these people? And then I realized, well, I don't have anything to say. So, God, what do you have to say to all of these people? And, and I just, I remember feeling like that night, like this, this overwhelming, like, pressure on me that day. And I remember I just kept praying, okay, God, what do you want to say? What do you want to say? What do you want to say? And then the thought of just unity came to my mind. And how important unity is if you're going to accomplish and do anything that God desires for you to do. And it was kind of a theme that kept coming up in conversations that I was having during the week and things we were interacting with with the other pastors. And so I felt like maybe this is what God desires for me to talk. So I began to just pray about that and begin to dig into that. And the message was formulated from that. And, and really the ultimate uh, conclusion of the message was that in order for us to really make a difference for Christ, we need to be willing to work together. Pastors, 
especially pastors sometimes down in Brazil, they, they ran into the problem with the authoritarian pastor who really wouldn't listen to anyone and, and was really like, I'm the one, I'm the one that God has called me to lead, you know, kind of thing. And so, you know, that week we kept coming up with, like, you need to trust your leaders, you need to trust your leaders, and we're together in unity. But then there was also this problem with competition between churches and seeing the other church as the enemy. And so we kept talking about, like, no, work together. See them, as, see them as, you know, you're working together for the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is bigger than your church. So we kept emphasizing that during the week. And then what happened was at night, uh, I had had this experience at another conference, and so I thought, you know what, this might be fun tonight to talk about how we can work together. And so I came out and I said, tonight we are going to make it rain. And people looked at me like, what are you talking about? And some people got excited because they thought cash was going to start flying down. No, no, not that kind of rain. And so what we did was we broke up the 1,000 people that are there into segments. So we had segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four, and segment five on the balcony. And so what I did was I had segment one start with this, and then segment two, and then seg you know, all the way through. And then segment one, we started going like this, and segment two and three, and then we went all the way through. And then we went like this, all the way through. And then I had people like stomp their feet as hard as they can. You know, no, first I started with clapping. It's like, and then I started with stomping your feet as loud as you can. And it, did, it was like this huge like, storm that was happening inside. And then I had them go in reverse. And it did. It felt like it was like a, a total rainstorm that happened inside the building. And when that was done, people were like, yeah! <laughs> they were like so excited and moved by that. And I just basically said, that's a picture of what it's like when we work together in unity. And it really was, it was a powerful moment. And, and I walked away feeling so, I don't know, feeling so empowered by God. Because it, again, it, it, I felt like it wasn't me that spoke that night, it was just God speaking through me. And it was just such an incredible, incredible experience. And I look at it not because I had an opportunity to speak before a thousand people, although that was really cool. But it wasn't anything that was like me patting myself in the back. It was just, God, you gave me a chance to be a part of something incredible. A part of something incredible. Now, we're in the middle of a series that we're doing called Soul Lucian. And the idea behind that is many of us have problems and challenges that we go through. We look for a solution to those problems or challenges. And so over the course of the series, we said that there are certain things that exist within our soul, certain challenges that exist within our soul. So let's see if we can find the solution that God provides to be able to satisfy and meet those challenges. Let's see if we can find that. And so then, as we're doing the series, uh, one of the things we've also been looking at is we, ultimately we're going to release a brand new link on our website called Next Steps. And for that website, we're going to be looking at just the spiritual disciplines that we could take and implement into our lives and how they make a difference. And so over the course of this series, what we've been doing is, on Sundays, we've been talking about why the disciplines are so important. And then what we've done on our podcast during the week is we've talked about how to do those disciplines. How to do those disciplines. So the idea is that the Sunday sermons and the podcast come together to create a complete idea or thought for the week. And then we're taking those notes from those two and that's what will be what fills in the material as well as other research and things that were done to do the next step. So we're really excited about that, and we can't wait until we have the opportunity to launch that. So keep your eyes open, uh, because we will be announcing that when that does happen. But with that, over the course of this series, we've been looking at the challenges for our soul. We've been looking at that. And here's what we said the first week, is, is we gave the illustration of the picture and we said that, that our soul needs to be poured into. Our soul needs to be poured into. And so that's what we did for the first week in looking at that. And here's what we said is what we, what we need to do is if our soul is over poured into, then we begin to flow over, and it really begins to ultimately make a mess. And so what we said is we need our soul poured into, but at some point we need to begin to pour out, strategically pouring out our soul and pouring out our lives. I, I saw an illustration. Uh, this week that I wanted to, to share with you, I thought was really interesting. Because how many of you have asked this question, why am I here? If you ask that question, raise your hand. Why am I here? Why am I here? What's, what's my purpose? Why do I exist? 
And there's a reason why we ask that question. There's a fundamental reason behind our hearts and our soul why we ask that question. And the power of this illustration I thought was so incredible about what happens when people begin to pursue their purpose and the difference that it makes. And the illustration was this. It's the honeybee. And one of the purposes of the honeybee is to find nectar to be able to bring that back to the hive so they can create honey and, and be able to build from that. And so what happens is the honeybee then leaves the hive and it goes to the flowers. And from the flowers, it begins to gather pollen. And it'll go from flower to flower to flower, gathering pollen, gathering nectar. But what happens is as the bee is fulfilling its purpose, gathering nectar, then what it does is it goes to the next flower, and because it has pollen on it, it, pollen, it pollinizes. Pollinizes? Is that a word? People are like, Todd's like, no. <laughs> it pollinates. There we go. Thank you. I didn't do so well in biology. Um, but it pollinates the next flower. And then it pollinates. So because the bee is doing its purpose, it's actually bringing more flowers and creating more life because of it. So in other words, this bee, by pursuing its purpose, is creating something bigger, something grander. And the odds are the bee has no idea. It's just doing what it does. And so the idea behind this is if we can begin to understand our creation, the way that God has made us, and begin to pursue that, we will begin to see the difference that it makes in our lives. But here's the thing I want to encourage you to do, is just begin to think about how many things do you see around you that are part of a grand design, that are part of something bigger. I mean, just think about your body. Your body is composed of different systems, right? So for example, you have the respiratory system, which brings oxygen into your body. That oxygen works its way into your circulatory system, which takes it throughout your body. As it's going throughout your body, it's, it's gathering the carbon dioxide which then it brings back to your respiratory system, which expels the carbon dioxide. So that's only just two systems working together. What about all the other systems of the body that works together for a grander purpose? Now, when I wrote this message, I was at Coffee Bean. Uh, sorry, T. Was, my daughter works at Starbucks, and so I was fraternizing with the enemy this week. Um, but I was at Coffee Bean, and I was writing this message. And I, I was just looking at my my matcha latte, and I begin to realize like how much that is a part of a grand design. Because you had someone that had to grow the coffee bean and a tea leaf, and then you had someone who had to harvest that, and then you had someone who had to, to gather it and then ship it, and then someone who had to transport it, and then someone who had to unload it, and then someone who had to grind it, and then someone who had to be the barista to make my incredible drink, and of course, you had to have someone drink it. But again, you look at that, it's just coffee, but it's a part of a grand design. I mean, just look at this bottle of water, which I guess I, I was really thirsty and squeezed really hard. Uh, but just look at this. All the elements that had to come together for me to be able to have this bottle of water to quench my thirst this morning. See, there's a part of us that knows. When I began to look around me, when I began to look at the trees, when I look at the sky, when I look at the water, when I look around me, when I look even at cars driving up and down the street, when I go to my office, there's a part of us that knows when I look at everything around me, there seems to be a bigger, grander design for everything around me. So why not me? Why not me be a part of a bigger, grander design? And so with that in mind, as I said before, our souls are designed to be a part of something grander than us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning, is we are going to look at an example of people who came together and something incredible happened. So in Acts chapter 12, it talks about that there was this point where James, the brother of John, John is the guy that wrote uh, the fourth gospel of the New Testament. His brother was arrested and killed. And Herod the king at that point saw that it really pleased the people. And so he thought, man, what if I arrested somebody else? And so in this passage, Peter gets arrested. And here's what it says in Acts chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of 
under the guard of four separate squads of four soldiers each. So he was making sure Peter didn't get away. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed earnestly for him. Now that bringing Peter out for public trial, that's called for Peter was about to get taken out. That's called for that. Peter was about to get killed. And so there's, there, and, and, and think about it. If you see that you killed James, the brother of John, and now you got Peter, I mean, you got the big fish, right? You got the guy that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. You got the guy that after Jesus had ascended into heaven, that preached the very first message, this guy preached, and 3,000 people made commitments to Christ that day. You got that guy. You got the guy that upon him, as well as on the other disciples, was an outpouring of healing. And so they would heal the sick, the lame, and there's even a point where Peter raised someone from the dead. You got that guy. And then not only that, you have this guy who gets a vision from God and realizes that the gospel is not only intended just for the Jews, but it's also intended for the Gentiles. He goes to someone's home, a guy named Cornelius, he goes to his home, and his entire household becomes believers that day. So we're talking about someone through whom God was moving mightily, and that's the guy you got in prison. That's the guy. So if James pleased everyone, how much was Peter killing him going to please everyone? And it, and it says in that passage, it says, the church prayed earnestly. Now, the Greek word for earnestly there, I thought was really powerful. It, it talked about where, where someone prayed beyond their potential. They prayed beyond their potential. It, it talked about this, the, 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 the Greek word communicates this idea of strenuous effort. Like, like there, there's no way I'm going to quit. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going. That's the idea of this earnest prayer. Because they were that passionate about God freeing Peter. And I tell you, one of the things I really desire to do is I desire to see Encounter become more and more of a praying church. I really do. And so one of the ways that I want to do that is I would love to create a team of people who would be willing to come on Sunday mornings and gather before the service to pray for the service and pray for God working in the service. I would love to create a team for that. And we'll be announcing that and looking at that and building that. The other thing I want to do is I want to create a prayer wall at our church. And so that's what this wall is going to become right here. This wall is going to become a prayer wall. And here's what we're going to do with it, is we're going to create something on the wall where you can come in on Sundays and you can grab a slip of paper. If you have a prayer request, you can grab that prayer request, you can write it out, and you can put it on the wall. And you can make it anonymous or you can put your name on it if you want. But you're going to put that on your wall, and then when people come in, they can see that and pray for that prayer request, and pray for you, and pray for whatever it is that your prayer request may be. And then I would love to be able to have like an answered prayer on the wall, and to be able to move whatever those prayer requests are, to move to the point where they're answered, and we see God moving and God working. That would be really neat. But that's what we're going to do with this wall. So look for that, because that's going to be coming. But I do, I really want to see our church embrace the power and the significance of prayer. Because it is prayer that changes things. It is prayer that invites God to work. It is prayer that causes us to realize that Jesus, I need you. And the truth is we can't do anything as a church if we're not seeking God to lead us in it. So my desire is to see Encounter become more and more of a praying church. Because it is. Prayer does change the world. It really does. And if anything, if it doesn't change the world, it changes us. But it'll change something. It, it goes on to say in this passage, in Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was fast asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. 
and the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So it says Peter was arrested before Passover. We don't know how long he had been arrested. Passover, Passover lasts for eight days. So we don't know which of the days that he was arrested on. But however, what happens is we know that once Passover hit, this was the night before, and Peter knew it was about to happen. And he was about to get killed. He knew that. So imagine that you're Peter and put yourself in his position. Put yourself in his position. How do you think you would react in this moment where now you see this incredible thing happening? How do you think you would react? And, and I love what it says about Peter. It says in verses 9 and 10, so Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and the second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. So Peter thought this was a vision. He thought, man, this is a good dream. Have you ever had those? Have you ever had those dreams that you were dreaming? That, I mean, it, that it, it is so good. That, that you just don't want anyone to wake you up. Like, this, this, is, a, this is a good one. So I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that Peter's in that state thinking that this is just a great dream. I, I pray to be delivered. I'm facing death. I'm praying to be delivered. So God, thank you for this great dream. Or maybe this. Have you ever had those moments that seem to be so incredible, so beyond perception, that what do you do? You pinch yourself to see if you're really awake, to see if it's really true. So Peter's kind of in this moment. And it goes on, and it says this in verse 11. Finally, Peter came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. This is really real. This is is really happening. When I read this, I thought about the, the movie The Matrix. There's this one point, and of course, everything goes back to The Matrix, doesn't it? It always does. I, I, oh, whatever. <laughs> but, but there's that part where Neo is being interviewed by Agent Smith, and they do the thing where you know, Neo has no mouth, and then they put the bug, they bug Neo, and the bug goes inside of Neo. And then Neo wakes up, to his, his, Neo wakes up the next day. And then he meets up with Trinity and some of the other guys from the Nebuchadnezzar, the ship that they were on. And so they're driving Neo, and basically they convince Neo to just lay back, and they put this machine on Neo, and then they actually pull the bug out of Neo. And you guys remember what Neo's response? What did he say? He said, what? That was real? That was real? Like, that really happened to me? So that's the picture that I think of. Peter in that moment thinking like, what? This is really real. This really happened to me. I've been really set free. I've been really set free. So it goes on to say in verses 12 through 15, when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. So just to give you a background of who John Mark is, John Mark eventually becomes the writer of the gospel of Mark, the third gospel of I'm sorry, the second Mark, uh, second gospel of the New Testament. But John Mark becomes that, that writer. The goes to the home of John Mark, where they gather for prayer. So the people are there, they're praying, and what are they praying for? Peter to be what? Released. They're gathering, they're praying, and they're praying earnestly and fervently. It says, he knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. It must be his angel. 
So imagine this. And, and we all go through those moments too. Where we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray. And it just doesn't seem like it's working out. But then God does something that is so extraordinary that it's hard to believe that that's what God really did. And so at this point, so again, they're praying for Peter to be released. The girl comes and tell her, tell them that Peter's standing at the door, and they tell her, you're crazy. You're crazy. And then they said, it must be his angel, which means they've either come to one conclusion, and that means, yeah, he's dead. That's his angel at the door, letting us know he's dead. So imagine this, you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, you get the answer to your prayer, and then you don't believe the answer. We can also be guilty of that too, sometimes. But it goes on to say in verses 16 and 17, meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened. He said, and then he went to another place. He went to another place. Our souls are designed to be a part of something grander than us. So imagine you come together. You are praying for this incredible movement of God. The incredible movement of God happens. And here he is. He is standing right in front of you. We desire to be a part of something grander than ourselves. So here's what I want to challenge us to do. I want to challenge us. It's time to stop hearing how good is, how good God is, and start seeing how good God is. Let's start praying. Let's start getting involved. Let's start connecting. Let's start reaching out. Let's start serving. Let's start giving. Because again, remember what we said is we said that our souls are designed to be poured into. So when talking about being poured into, we talked about prayer and how God pours into us that way. We talked about reading scripture and how God pours into us that way. We talked about gathering together and how God pours into us that way. How those elements need to be a part of the spiritual disciplines of our lives. But part of the spiritual disciplines is not only about taking in, it's also about pouring out. And it is when we begin to pour out that we recognize that our souls are designed to be a part of something grander than ourselves. And we begin to see the reality of what God desires for us to experience in our lives. So if you're living the Christian life where all you're doing is being poured into but you are never pouring out, you're only living a limited life. You're not even remotely close to the abundant life that Jesus has promised you. There's something about when we decide, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to begin to pour out my life and allow you to use me. Our souls are designed to be a part of something grander than us. You know what else our souls are designed for? Our souls are designed to produce life. Our souls are designed to produce life. This is why God tells us to pour out. Because our souls are designed to produce life. And if you think about it, if you begin to look at all the elements that are around us, that produces life. Like you look at our physical bodies, we are capable of being able to produce life. We look at, you know, the air around us, that helps to contain life and also produces life. Even fire. We look at fire as a destroyer, but we also, did you also realize that fire can produce life as well? Because what happens is when the fire heats up, then all of a sudden, the pine cones that are on the ground, the heat gets to the pine cone and the pine cone releases seed. And so as the fire clears out all the ground around the pine cone, the seed that is released eventually begins to become a new plant. So even fire that is so destructive can also begin to produce new life. Water produces life. We are designed the way that God has designed everything else that is around us. As it is designed to produce life, we are designed to produce life. And it is in stepping out and we begin to produce life that we also begin to allow ourselves to experience being a part 
as something incredible. So now this raises the question, how does God use us to produce life? And again, it's about what pours out of us, what pours out of our lives, and the difference that that can make. So how do we allow God to begin to use our lives to pour out? There are three ways. The first one is to serve. It's serving. And it's saying, God, I'm going to step in and allow my life to be served by you. That's one of the elements. One of the marks of someone who is a true disciple of Jesus is someone who uses their lives to serve others. To serve others. So the thing that we have to ask ourselves is, am I making... Because here's what we said about the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines make room for God to do something incredible in our lives. And so part of the spiritual discipline is serving. If you are a follower of Jesus, serving is an expectation for our lives. It's an expectation. So begin to think about who are you designed to serve? To serve? High school students, junior high students, elementary kids, preschool kids, who are you designed to serve? Homeless, those who are in prison, who are you designed to serve? And then begin to do that. Begin to serve them. Your neighbor, your co-worker, who are you designed to serve? And start allowing it. That's when you see God show up. That's when you see the incredible happen, is when you start to serve. And what about invest? See, well, investing is when we take serving to the next level. And what happens with investing is I begin to connect with someone who is at a point where they desire to get to know Jesus deeper because of the experience that they've had with me. So if you're someone who's saying, I don't have connections, I don't have relationships, I don't have people that I can introduce to Jesus. Start serving. Start serving. And see what doors God will open for you to begin to build those relationships. And then you begin to invest. When that door opens and someone is responsive to hearing the message of Jesus Christ, begin to invest. What are you investing? The stories, the work that God has done in your life. And then you, as a result of investing, begin to guide them in their spiritual walk. Now you may be wondering, Ken, I don't know if I know how to do that. That's what the Next Steps link will be, empower you to be able to do as well. As it walks you through, you'll be able to take someone and say, here's how I built my life to come to know God, so let's walk through this and let's do this together. And you can help them to be able to invest in them as well. Serving, investing. The third way, giving. Giving. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, buddy. I knew at some point the pitch was going to come. That, you know, spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines, he's got to be talking about giving money to the church. I am. I'm going to be honest with you. There's something about giving. And here's the thing that I love what God does. is God says, I'm going to test you, but not destroy you. So he says, start at 10%. Give 10%. 10% is enough to test you, but not destroy you. It's enough to test you. It's enough to put you in a place where you're saying, God, I'm no longer relying on money as the answer for my life. I'm no longer relying on riches and successes as the answer for my life. So God, I'm going to trust you. Now, realize that giving also applies to more than just money. It also applies to your time. It also applies to your talents and your abilities. It's where you begin to release those things that are in your life and you put them into God's hands and say, God, you handle it. God, you take care of it. You take care of it. And I will trust you to take care of me as I release to you and allow you to begin to serve others through me. Giving. Now, I know for some of us the idea of giving is really difficult. Because with giving, we, one of the things that we have a tendency to do when we first began to look at giving is we began to look at our what? Limitations. I have a limited amount of money. I have a little bit, limited amount of time. I have a limited amount of energy. I have a limited amount of resources. I look at this piece of paper, for example, and there's a limit. I only have four corners. That's my limit. 
That's my limit. But what if we did this? What if we said, God, in my limitations, I'm going to begin to trust you. So what I do is I take a corner and I give it to God. What's happened to my four corners? My four corners has now become five. So then what do I do is I say, God, I see how you're taking care of my life. So what do I do? I give another corner. And now what's happened? My four corners has now become six. And I say, oh, oh, oh this is good. This is, so, so you know what, dude? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to God. And now I have seven corners. And then I give again. And I have eight corners. Well, this is kind of a rigid, so maybe 17 corners. But, but you kind of get the idea is I began to give to God, and here's the truth. You know what this proves? You cannot outgive God. Now, don't get this wrong. Here is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying if you give God $10, he will give you 100 That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is there is something that comes with the attitude of giving. When you begin to release and you begin to trust God, and then what happens is you start to step into the experience of knowing God and all he has. And what happens is the more corners I cut, what happens is the more corners I have. And then you might say, well, Ken, eventually what happens is you will have no more corners because it's a circle. But here's the truth is, no, you now have reached a point where you have infinite corners because of the fact that you have continued to trust God. And what happens is when you begin to give to God, you begin to live the productive life that you were designed to live. So it's not just about being poured into. It's about pouring out of. So God, you fill me so that I can pour into the lives of others. You fill me so that I can pour into the lives of others. And, and so here's what we said. is We said the heartbeat of discipline is to pursue only what deeply satisfies my soul. That's what we said over the course of this entire series. The heartbeat of discipline is to only pursue what deeply satisfies my soul. So I want to encourage you to begin to look at this, to look at this. And begin to say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to recognize my soul is a part of a grander design that's bigger than me. So I'm going to begin to pour out. And Jesus, you use me the way that you desire to use me. I'm going to pour out in my limitations. I'm going to pour out in what little I have. I'm just going to begin to pour out. And God, you use whatever you desire to use in me. And so here's what we're really saying. is everything and nothing less. From this point forward, Jesus, that's the commitment I'm making. I am giving you everything and nothing less. I'm, I'm letting go. <laughs> I trust you. So I am giving to you everything and nothing less. Father, I pray that that's our commitment. Lord, I pray that that's our passion. Lord, I pray that that's what we will say to you. It's from this point forward. God, that's the commitment that I'm making. That's what I'm giving to you. I'm giving you my everything. Everything. And Jesus, in that, in this surrender, Father, may I see you in ways that I've never seen you before. May I trust you in ways that I've never trusted you before. May I begin to recognize your presence and your work and your desire and your miracle in my life in a way that I have never seen it before. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.
I, I imagine holding seeds in my hand. And the thing with the seeds is I look at them and I'm only limited to so many. So many. And our, and our natural tendency is to say, I want to hold on and protect the seeds that I have. Meanwhile, underneath, there's the ground. And what God is saying is, let go and plant the seed. And then watch what I will do. Watch what I will produce if you're willing to trust and rely on me. So that's my prayer. My prayer is that this morning that you'll say yes. That you'll say yes. That, Father, this morning I'm going to trust in you. My doubts, my fears, my worries, I know that I struggle with those. But, Lord, today is the day. I'm going to say yes to you. And I'm going to risk it. And I know that as I'm moving forward and I'm beginning to lay those things before you, as I'm beginning to plant those things into the ground and, and release control of that seed, I know that there are going to be moments where I will have to be able to work through those worries and work through those fears. I know that. I know that there will be moments where I will have to work through the desire to grab a shovel and dig those seeds back up and hold them back in my hand once again. I, I, I know that. So, Father, help me. Help me to fight through that, to trust in you, to depend on you. And again, let's let today, let's let today be the day where everything and nothing less becomes our prayer. Because when we do, you never know what you'll see, and you never know how you'll see that. So again, thank you so much for this coming this morning and allowing us this opportunity to be a part of your journey. And again, for those of you that want to support Encounter and what it is that we do as you're walking out the doors, on the walls, you will see boxes that you can drop your offering in. For those of you that are watching online, there will be a link in the description that you can click, and it will take you to a, a part of our website where you can be able to give online that way as well. But again, we appreciate you, and we appreciate this opportunity to be a part of your journey. And I would love, I would love to hear from you. If you're starting to implement some of the spiritual disciplines in your life, and you're giving them an effort, and you're giving them a try, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear your successes. I would love to hear your challenges. I would love to hear maybe how you're persevering, what are the things that you're learning. I would love to be able to hear that. So please, what you can do is you can leave a comment on our Facebook page. You can leave us a message there. You can email us. You can text me for those of you that have my phone number. I would love to hear what's happening in your life as you're beginning to pursue the spiritual disciplines. I would love to hear that. So with that, encounters about three things. Love up. Let's fall madly and passionately in love with God. Love out. Let's begin to pour out. Let's begin to pour out our lives into the lives of others so we can begin to see what God can do and how God can show up and love in. And here's the thing that you might find. When you begin to pour out in others, you may begin to find that you find qualities in yourself that you'll love that much more as well. But thank you so much. And go ahead and stand and join us for the last song.
good Sunday, y'all.